and welcome to The Sharpening. I am your host, Josh Beck. Tonight, we have a very special returning guest, S. Douglas Woodward, author of the new book, Is Russia Destined to Nuke the U.S.? Examining the Mounting uh, Near-Term Threat of Nuclear War on Our Nation. Uh, for our regular viewers and listeners of the show, you, you'll you remember Doug from uh, various past programs. He's been on a bunch of times. And uh, all our, all those episodes are still available on my YouTube channel. If you go to uh, youtube.com backslash Josh Peck Disclosure, uh, you can check those out. Um, S. Douglas Woodward is author of numerous books, including Power Quests 1 and 2, Final Babylon, uh, Lying Wonders of the Red Planet, Uncommon Sense, and now is Russia destined to nuke the topic of tonight's show. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Doug Woodward back to the show. Doug, how are you doing? Thanks, Josh. I'm doing great. It's good to be with you yet again, but it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, it has. It's. Uh, I think the last time was when we did Uncommon Sense, and that was right after um, the the Prophecy Forum conference in November. So it's it's been a few months. Yeah, yeah. so it's been almost six, seven months. Yeah, so it's been a while. You've been busy between then and now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After after the conference, everything kind of uh, ramped up, and uh, <laughs> yeah, That's it's good. this past year. Yeah, this past year has been amazing, and uh, I'm I'm excited about uh, things that are yet to come. And uh, this, I think, this next year is going to be even bigger. So, lots of stuff to look forward to. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I know the the pace of activity of new things. And, um, you know, eschatology, Bible prophecy is, boy, it is a, it's a burgeoning subject right now. And uh, uh, it's, there's a lot going on. So we got a lot to talk about. And I think the subject tonight, the stuff that I've been really researching over the last three, four months, um, is going to catch some people by surprise because it has not been an area of focus for really a number of years. Yeah, and that, that's why I'm glad that we're doing a show like this because, like I was telling you before the show, um, you know, I, I really don't know a whole lot about geopolitics. It's it's not a subject I actively study, though. Though recently, um, I've been trying to keep up on it more because so much is uh, ramping up uh, in terms of Bible prophecy and really just world affairs. So it, it's definitely something of importance that the church needs to keep an eye on. So I'm I'm really glad to be doing a show like this. Um, so we already went through your testimony and all that the first time you were on. Uh, people can people can check that out on the <laughs> YouTube channel if they're not familiar with you. But um, so I well I wanted to start uh, the 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 before we get into the material. The format of, of this new book is actually a little different uh, than your than your others, and and something I think was a really smart choice. Um, what what made you decide to uh, change the format up? Well, um, part of it has to do with you know, there's several factors. One is uh, if people are so busy these days, they they struggle to find the time to sit down and, and spend eight to 10 hours with a book. And um, there's so much to read that they could read. There's uh, so many TV programs. Nowadays, we get YouTube, lots of YouTube things. And so my, my sense is that whatever it is that uh, authors like you and me that we're going to say, we got to find ways to say it uh, a little faster than we have in the past. And so my goal is to write uh, things in such a way that it sort of fits within about a two hour window of time. Because people sort of, you know, it's like, I can pay attention for about two hours. I watch movies, they're about two hours. So if I want to read a book, I want to be able to read that book in about two hours. And so I'm thinking that's a good, you know, it's a good uh, kind of a good milestone or not milestone, really measuring stick. And so, um, you know, most of my books have been, they've been between, I'd say, 85,000 words and 120,000 words. And so that puts those books between about 300 to 450 pages. And to some extent, we authors, we kind of write for ourselves rather than write for our audiences. It's kind of like, you know, I don't, I, it's like the magnum opus. You know, we're writing this book almost like we're writing it for us versus really figuring out what is it that the audience really wants and how do they want to how do they want to see it and read it and, and how would they prefer to deal with it. And so I'm sort of experimenting with an idea that, to, to be frank, I kind of copied from you because you're uh, <laughs> you started writing many studies 
uh, when I first met you and we started talking, that was kind of your thing, the mini study ministry. And, and I thought, well, you know, it's what I've been progressively doing. And I joke with Doug Krieger because Doug Krieger and I wrote together, uh, the final Babylon and, and we worked together on uncommon sense, but you know, he's writing these, he wrote two books that really are one book called the two witnesses and they're each like 500 pages. And he wrote them both virtually at the yeah. same time and published them, you know, so it's a thousand pages. And I kid him, I'm saying, you know, do you really think you can ask a reader to spend a thousand pages, you know, to read something for a thousand pages? And, you know, no doubt there are folks out there that, that want to, but, but my sense is that so much is happening so fast, and especially in geopolitics, especially in what's going on between the United States and Russia, the United States and China, the United States and Iran, uh, what's happening in the Middle East, uh, the things move so rapidly, the, the complexion of things changes so quickly. You know, a good example would be ISIS. I mean, you know, about a yeah. year ago, we kind of didn't even know who this thing ISIS group was. And all of a sudden, they've really turned the Middle East upside down. And they threatened, you know, about, what, 10, 11 years worth of work in Iraq, uh, just in a matter of, of months almost. And so things happen so fast. So sort of a need to figure out a way to get material put together, assemble it, and get it to market in about three months and 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 have it be fresh and relevant and something that people can absorb quickly and, and that they really feel like, okay, you know, I've read this once, maybe I read it twice. I really understand the issue now. I understand what's going on. And if you ask, you know, the people in the street today, why is it that there's this big conflict in the Ukraine? You know, what is going on between Russia and the United States? And maybe they've heard some threats, you know, by, by Vladimir Putin about nuclear war. And, and But, you know, they don't know much about it. But it turns out, Josh, that this is really, this is, this is really crucial stuff. There's some really scary things going on in the world right now. And, and people, by and large, aren't aware of it. And so that's another thing I'm trying to do is, to, you know, be the watchman on the wall, figure this stuff out quickly, uh, synthesize it, analyze it, and then publish it rapidly so people can get up to speed and they can understand and then, you know, do something about it, take some action, even if the action is just to pray about it, uh, to tell other people about it. That's what we need to be about. We've got to move quickly. And, uh, we, you know, we sort of hear this phrase too much probably these days, being a watchman on the wall. But, you know, that is that is really the obligation for those of us that are in to the study of prophecy and writing and talking about eschatology is is that's kind of our job. We we sort of need to be the eyes and the ears for the church, see these things, talk about them, get the information out rapidly and uh, and, and really serve the, the body of Christ. Even if it's just the remnant, <laughs> we need to be serving that remnant and uh, doing what we do. So, so those are the things that caused me to come up with this idea of uh, what I'm calling a, a quick study series or a quick study book. And uh, so my goal is to sort of knock one of these things out about every three months and to pick the most topical subjects. That's great. That, I think that's a really smart way to go about it, too, because I was able to sit down and, and you know, read your book with it a couple hours and really learn a lot and it's mm -hmm. uh um if 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 i have it right because I, I have the pdf but uh the print right. copy it's uh eight and a half by 11 double column a little over right. 30 pages about yeah and, and yeah it's about 44 pages it's a little under twenty thousand words so if it were in like a regular format of a book it would be 85 pages maybe so you know it'd be it would be a small book but uh, as you said, it's something you could read in, in less than two hours, and uh, but you may want to refer to it because there's a lot of information in there, and you know footnotes, and then and then the other thing I'm doing is I'm working on my blog site to write additional articles that really just sort of pop right in that give you more information as things are progressing, and so I'm, I'm trying to do that now. That that may mean that you know two months from now I can kind of do a second edition and pull in another 20,000 words worth of material that I've written, um, you know, maybe tweak it a little bit and rework it a little bit so that it's, it has a little bit longer shelf life. But, but, uh, but I, it, it's kind of how I'm going to try to approach things. I've, I've probably written enough 300 and 400 page books, 
You know, I've demonstrated I can do that. And now the real issue is can I really get to a broader audience instead of, you know, most of my books I'll sell 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 copies, and that's great. But I, I really want to get something in the hands of 20,000 people. And, uh, you know, so a format that looks more like a magazine that uh, doesn't cost so much money. And, um, you know, like this book is going to sell – the paper copy is going to sell for nine ninety five. The Kindle copy probably is going to sell it for four dollars and ninety five cents or something like that. So it's more like buying a magazine, and uh, you know, very razor focused. Uh, but uh, I'm thinking that's kind of the overall marketing strategy. And 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 uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe it won't work. Maybe it'll be a great innovation. So we'll see. Yeah, well, I definitely think that's a a, a great way to go about it. And uh, you're putting more of those out a year, so that means uh, more episodes of the sharpening. <laughs> there you go. We have more reasons to talk. So uh, absolutely, yeah, you know, that's right. Well, it's well, it's a, it's a it's a strategy that people use, you know. So we'll we'll see how it works. We'll see how it works. Absolutely. Well, let's just let's uh, let's jump right in here. You know, it seems, uh, you know, like uh, you mentioned before, ISIS and a, l a lot of people, most people, I think, studying prophecy tend to focus on Islam or Iran and, and Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your book really focuses on, you know, another very important set of regions, uh, Russia and the U.S., and yep. uh, what, what made like that, you know, that that, that takes uh, that takes that uh, viewpoint? Um, I started noticing in some articles that that the conflict in the Ukraine, um, most people don't really even know where the Ukraine is, and they don't understand why it's important. And the more I've studied, the more I've realized that the Ukraine is almost at the at the center of the last 200 years of history, maybe the last 250 years. When one sort of understands this little you know, this little country, it's actually a pretty nice sized country. It's about the size of France, but it, it is right kind of in the, you know, sort of in the middle between Asia, Russia, and Europe. It is, has some of the richest soil. Uh, it has like, you know, like the sixth most rich content of soil in the world. Uh, it was known as the breadbasket of Europe. Um, it's been fought over for a thousand years. It has been at the forefront of controversy between the Russians, uh, formerly in the Turks, the Ottoman Empire. Um, the, the, the big thing that happened that really caught my attention was the annexation of, uh, of the Crimea, which is this little uh, you know, peninsula sort of appendage that hangs off the, the bottom of uh, Ukraine. I almost want to call it like the appendix, you know, and it's kind of like, the Crimea gives the world an appendicitis and because it, it turns out that the Crimean War took place just before the American Civil War, 1853 to 1856. And what happened in the Crimean War, and we can talk more about it as, as we have time, but it, it really set up the modern world. It set up the structures of Europe. Uh, it led directly to the First World War which really led directly to the Second World War. And what intrigued me about Crimea was that it was very crucial to these two first two for, uh, world wars. And with Russia annexing Crimea and it becoming uh, a hotspot between the United States, NATO, and Russia, the irony is that this little peninsula could be the, the powder keg that ignites World War III as well. And, uh, and, and why is it significant? Well, Crimea is significant primarily because it sits on the Black Sea. It is where Russia has had for almost 250 years a naval base, a warm water port naval base. Now, you know, Russia has naval bases uh, up in the Baltic Sea, but frankly, they freeze over in the wintertime. And so Russia has always wanted to have a warm water port. And so the Black Sea by sneaking through the Black Sea down to this little sea called uh, Mar Marmara, I believe it's, it's pronounced that way, which means marble in Greek, because this little island right there in this little sea is, is where there's a high concentration of marble. And it's mentioned in some of the old uh, you know, writings in Greek mythology and all that. But you sneak through that, you go right through Istanbul, uh, or Constantinople in the in the old days, 
and it takes you into the Mediterranean. And so it's Sevastopol is the name of this Russian naval base in the Crimea. And it was established really by Catherine the Great back in about 1750, 1760. That's how far back all this really goes. And, wow. um, you know, and so there's this sort of long chronology of history and events that Sevastopol was was actually really the reason Putin needed to annex the Crimea because the Crimea is there's some of the eastern part of the Ukraine that separates Russia from Crimea and so he sort of had to grab um, the the southeast sort of slot or slice of the Ukraine taking down to the Crimea so he could preserve his naval base his submarines primarily there in the Black Sea. Uh, he has one aircraft carrier. I mean, that's, you know, the U.S. has 19. Russia has one aircraft carrier, and it was constructed in about 1991. It's the uh, Kuznetsov, and it's uh, it's old technology. It was built during, basically designed and built uh, at the so time of the Soviet Union. Um, it was commissioned in 1991, just after the fall of the Soviet Union. But, uh, you know, Russia, from a naval power standpoint, very weak. But then the strategic issue is that Russia has extremely strong nuclear weapons. And we probably don't even know the full extent. Certainly, it's not public. Our military may have intelligence about it. But all of a sudden, this conflict began to happen in the Ukraine. And you started hearing Russia saber-rattling, talking about their nuclear weapons, NATO going back and forth, the United States getting involved in this discussion. It's really been over the last 18 months, and it's heated up to the point now where all of a sudden uh, Putin has announced 40 new ICBMs that he's putting into service. The U.S. has moved a quick command force of over 5,000 troops. They've shipped a bunch of tanks and a bunch of armored carriers. They're putting them right on the border with Russia. And what people don't know, but if you start reading articles or if you read my book, you're going to find out that the Cold War is on again. And the Cold War, we're, we're actually at a, at a real threat of having a nuclear exchange uh, between NATO, but really the United States and the Soviet Union for the first time since 1962. Uh, during what was called the Cuban Missile Crisis. You're too young to know about the Cuban Missile Crisis. I grew up, I was like eight years old when that happened. And so I can still kind of remember that. So, um, uh, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's a very historic, uh, it's, a, it's a very um, m monumental development that's occurred. And from the standpoint of Bible prophecy, this is something that, you know, how Lindsay talked about in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, back in 1970. But it's known in Bible prophecy as a conflict between Gog and Magog uh, of this great area of Eastern Europe and Central Asia against Israel. And one of the, the strong sentiments I have in my thesis is that if one reads Ezekiel 38, 39 carefully, and Jeremiah 50 and 51, which I've already done studies and written about, called uh, the Final Babylon, talking about America as Babylon. So if you if you look at the passages in Ezekiel 38 and 39, and then the chapters in Jeremiah 50 and 51, uh, two chapters that I addressed along with my co-authors in the Final Babylon, Doug Krieger and Dean McGriff, is um, the story is is unfolding there that the daughter of Babylon, which I happen to believe is the United States, uh, is attacked by a confederation of nations from the north quarters, the northern quarters, it says. And likewise, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, what we learn is that Gog and Magog, with a whole host of nations from the north, as well as uh, Persia, Libya, Put, Put, uh, and a series of, of nations from North Africa, the Middle East, and so forth. They attack Israel, but at the same time, it appears they're attacking um, those that dwell in unwalled villages, those that dwell securely in the coastlands, 
uh, the Young Lions, Sheba and Didan, which is Saudi Arabia. And there's a war going on. The, the way that the verses talk about it, it's saying as Gog and Magog moves against Israel at the same time, an evil thought comes into their mind. And that evil thought is that they will attack these other nations and one would see that they're probably nations aligned with or allied with Israel, and they decide to attack both. And so the, so the, the speculation on my part, which I believe is actually legitimate interpretation of the scripture, is that uh, Russia, uh, which I believe most scholars believe, Russia is Gog and Magog, yeah. and, and uh, although there's some debate about that, but but two really good studies that were done in 2006, we'll talk about those. Um, they affirm, I think, pretty carefully, pretty precisely that we're dealing with Russia and that it attacks Israel and simultaneously it attacks the United States. And, um, and so the thesis is the United States is being targeted and has been targeted for potentially decades by Russia. Um, and, and we can get more into that, but anyway, that's, that's kind of the overall story of what's going in this book is what's happening in the Ukraine, the Crimea, what it's leading to potentially to happen between the U S and Russia, and then how it fulfills Bible prophecy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's, it's very important. And I, I actually like that. You, you start off the, the book with a, a big question that, that is actually, <laughs> I, I took that as a question for the interview because it's, it's a broad question, but it's really important. Um, so feel free to take as much time as you need to you know, fully explain because I know there's a lot of moving parts in, in this whole sure. thing. But, um, sure. So, so uh, I'm going to put your own question back towards you from your book. Okay. Are, okay. Are, <laughs> are Russia and the United States setting the stage for World War III? Um. I think that Russia is, I think the United States is unwittingly helping to facilitate that. Um, there's, you know, real question as to just how much more powerful, when we're dealing with nuclear weapons, how much more powerful is the United States over the Soviet Union? The answer is it may not be. Now, yeah, we have a lot more submarines. Uh, that have a lot of missiles, but it's not likely that Russia fully reports all of the missiles and the warheads that they have. Um, right. And it's uh, also, if we look at just tactical nukes, there's really two different theaters to consider. One is sort of the European theater, just the tactical uh, conflicts that could exist right along the borders of Russia uh, with Poland with the, the Baltic states, which are Estonia, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, um, moving further south to the Ukraine, Bulgaria, Romania, um, uh, the, known as the Balkans, that whole area. Um, so Russia, of course, borders all of those. And in that theater, Russia has, uh, it's estimated, at least 2,000 tactical nuclear weapons, which are smaller rockets or missiles, uh, bombs, uh, artillery shells, but they're they're much smaller. They're probably uh, no more than five to ten percent the size of the of the bomb that went off Hiroshima. Uh, so they might have a fireball about the size of Yankee Stadium, but they might have a kill radius of say let's say three three miles, you know, in, in terms of diameter. So it's still a spectacularly powerful bomb, but it's not a strategic weapon that's going to wipe out, let's say, a whole city. But Russia has perhaps as many as 2,000 just in Europe. They have perhaps as many as 25,000 of these weapons um, scattered basically around Russia. And then uh, comparing that to what does, the, what does the U.S. and NATO have, the U.S. and NATO has about 10% of that or about 200 tactical weapons in the uh, European sort of Eurasian uh, theater. Uh, directly opposing or serving as a threat to uh, to Russia. And I may occasionally say Soviet Union, which just shows that I'm, you know, I'm as old as I am, and I, I still think of Russia and the Soviet Union is sort of one and the same, which isn't true, although some people say it is true. 
but that gets into some conspiracy theory that we can't really prove. Um, and so, uh, so you've got the tactical theater. So you've got a, uh, a a tremendous number of of tactical nuclear weapons that could be used if Russia determined it wished to neutralize uh, NATO or penalize NATO in some way for. Uh, attacking or threatening to attack Russia, and keeping in mind that the Na that NATO and the United States is doing exactly that. They are stacking these things up right on the border. It would be exactly the same as if Russia started stacking uh, uh, nuclear weapons as well as conventional weapons uh, in um, you know in Ottawa or in uh, you know in in Ciudad de Juarez or whatever in <laughs> Tijuana, you know, right, right on our border. You know, and we don't really like the idea of having an enemy uh, having missiles that are within just a few miles of our border. But that's exactly what we do to to Russia. Right. Uh, and we have done that really ever since the 1950s. And that's kind of what led to the Cuban Missile Crisis, where, you know, basically the, the Russians deployed um, dozens of nuclear missiles only 90 miles away from the United States. And of course, what's the advantage of that? Well, you have absolutely no warning time. So missiles launched in basically three to five minutes, you know, cities destroyed. And that's essentially the same thing that Russia worries about is that they are more um, likely to be attacked uh, in a first strike scenario because NATO and the United States has so many weapons so close to, uh, to Russia's key cities. So, you know, it's like, Ukraine, Kiev is only 500 miles from Moscow. And, oh, wow. you know, so it, it's really, this is really compact area. And um, then you get into strategic weapons, ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And, um, and you know, the, the balance of power there is supposed to be something like roughly 5,500 to 6,000 U.S. missiles versus about 7,000. Uh, Russian missiles. Then you get into how many warheads, independently targetable warheads, does each missile have? And in the old days, it might have been four. Now it could be as many as 15. So you could wow. have, you know, let's say Russia has, let's say they have 7,000 missiles. Well, they might have, on average, let's say 12 uh, warheads per missile. Now all of a sudden you're talking about 84,000, you know, 8,400, did I just do the math right? Um, no, 84,000 nuclear weapons, you know, that are targetable, uh, could wipe out every city in the United States. And, uh, and, and it could do that in a first strike mode, and those missiles could be launched, and they could hit every city in the United States in less than 30 minutes. So there wow. is virtually no time to respond. And in 19, I think it was 1997, Clinton passed a, a law that basically said, we will not fire back if we detect, or we think we detect, a Russian missile launch. We will not fire back until the missiles hit us. Meaning that oh, we will geez. not fire upon warning, we will only fire upon being struck. And, you know, at one level, that kind of makes sense because you're saying, well, you don't want to fire off a weapon when you really, you know, really it was a it, it wasn't really an attack. We were wrong. The other side of it, though, is that if you wait and you don't fire off those messages, you know, your missiles, those Russian missiles could wipe out every one of our silos and basically completely eliminate all of our missiles before we could get off a counterattack. And so what's happened, and these are, this, is, this is what's really different today from where it's been, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, is that our military and the Russian military believe that a nuclear war is winnable. They think the threshold for using nuclear weapons has dropped significantly. There is a new thinking that what used to be you know, considered MAD, the mutually assured destruction, and radioactive fallout radioactive fallout dissipates much more rapidly than we thought. Um, and it is conceivable that one can have a successful first strike. There are very effective anti-missile defense systems 
the Russians probably have a much more sophisticated anti-missile defense system than we do. And then there's this issue of the of the newness and the testing of the of the bombs of the missiles. We have not built a nuclear device. Uh, we've built delivery systems like missiles and planes, but we haven't built a new nuclear warhead in over 20 years. Oh and wow! So technically, you know, and and they're sort of after 15 years. There's a little question about the viability. Are they reliable? And so you get into those issues, and uh, and then we can get into, you know, the issue of submarines. How, you know, can submarines really withstand um, a nuclear war? The um, aircraft carriers we have, basically, eleven aircraft carrier groups of major aircraft carriers, and we have another eight or nine smaller aircraft carriers that the Marines use. So altogether, we have roughly nineteen twenty aircraft carriers. The Russians have one, but in the next war aircraft carriers will probably be one of the first targets. Aircraft carriers in World War III will be like battleships were in World War II. Battleships were very effective in World War I, but in World War II, the aircraft carrier came about and battleships were essentially destroyed by fighter air, uh, airplanes. And so battleships were basically wiped out. They no longer were viable uh, naval vessels. Well, what's likely to happen in the next war is that aircraft carriers, if you go nuclear, aircraft carriers are likely to be um, an unsuccessful naval vessel as well. Plus, there are new level types of, of missiles that fire and they, they reside just they run just a little bit above the water surface, and there's almost no way to shoot them down. And so if Russia were to come after our aircraft carriers, there is a very high probability that they would wipe out most of our aircraft carriers very rapidly. All right, so, uh, and it's not like we have to, you know, try to wipe the aircraft carriers off out because they only got one. So right. it's not, <laughs> that's, not, that's not what they're relying upon. You know, so and we have a lot more subs than they do, um, but it's also conceivable that that Russia has so many missiles um, available to them that they can use missiles like depth charges. So they can basically fire a nuclear missile into the water somewhere within, I think it's about an 18 uh, kilometer diameter, and basically let's say about 12 miles. So uh, if you know where a sub is or close to knowing where the sub is, you drop a, you, you send a nuclear missile into the water and it goes off, it basically will wipe out a sub even though it may be five miles away or 10 miles away. And so there's, there's reasons to believe that uh, our defense systems are far more vulnerable than, than anyone understands. Certainly our public doesn't know this. And, and yet, when you begin to go through and look at the research out on the internet, and, and these are reliable, we're not look, I'm not talking about conspiracy theory websites, I'm talking about Bloomberg, Reuters, you know, AP, um, you know, the Telegraph, these different uh, news sources that are out there, they talk about these things. Now, you go to t TV like ABC, NBC, CNN, Fox, even Fox News, they don't talk about these things. Because right. it takes a while to, you know, if you can't get it done in a three-minute soundbite with the debate between a left person and a right person, they don't even want to cover it. And that's the nature of network news. So Americans are, by and large, not informed about the, the real risks that are going on. And they have no understanding about what is really happening in the Ukraine and why it's strategically risky uh, and why the Cold War sable-rattling uh, rhetoric is going on right now back and forth virtually every day between um, the Russians and the American military. And uh, it's, you know, every day I find dramatic new things and I try to write now, I'm trying to write three or four blogs a week that are hitting some of these same subjects to supplement uh, the new book that that is uh, being released. Um, I'm not sure exactly when this program will be aired, uh, you might give me some clue uh, because the we're planning to I'm planning to release the book for sale on Amazon August 1st, 
but it's going to actually be available for sale a little a few days before for people that are listening to your program or other people's programs. Um, I won't generally announce it available till about August the first. So, so if this goes up in a few days, then people can actually find the book. Uh, Is Russia destined to nuke the U.S.? Actually, out on out on Amazon for about I think it's nine ninety five right now. Kindle book will be available a few a few weeks from now. Good deal. Yeah, I um I'm hoping to have it up as early as tomorrow, possibly if uh, if my kids let me work on it. <laughs> you know, we'll right. see. But but right. uh, yeah, I, uh, I I recently was able to update my internet connection, so things go a lot faster now. Uh, oh, so hopefully, yeah, hopefully by. Uh, tomorrow, which will be the 22nd. Uh, that's what I'm hoping. If not, then shortly, uh, very shortly after. Well, it, it um, is available now. It is available. It will be available if uh, if folks listen to this and they want to go uh, look at the look at the book and read about it and so forth. It's it's out there at Amazon uh, right now, and it's only at Amazon at this moment in time. It'll be available through other ministries and and the different eBooks, iBook, Nook, Lulu, as well as uh, Kindle will all be available probably. Oh, by the 10th of August, something like that. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, so pe people should definitely uh, pick that up. Um, so let, let's say that political tensions continue to intensify and, and Russia does decide to use a nuclear uh, weapon on the U.S. What, what would that buildup actually look like? Like, What kinds of things could we expect to see before that day comes? Or do you believe that it would be uh, just all of a sudden and without warning? Well, there's a couple of different ideas. Um, supposedly, according to some books that were written uh, really 15, 20 years ago by um, folks that, um, uh, what's it called when someone uh, defects, uh, defectors, uh, defectors that were generals or in uh, Russian intelligence, KB, KGB, um, there was a book called The Perestroika Deception. Uh, there was a book called Spetsnaz. Spetsnaz is kind of like the... Uh, uh, Navy SEALs of uh, Russian special ops. And these books basically say that the way that it will come come down is that the first blows that will be delivered will be what appear to be Arab attacks on the United States, on several United States cities via the so-called suitcase nuke. Um, and that it really will not be Arabs. It will be suitcase nukes that have been transported into the United States years ago and have just been sitting waiting for the day and the hour when they're going to be set off. And so the idea is that six, eight, ten U.S. cities would be hit by the suitcase nukes, which are uh, relatively low yield. They're sort of two to five kilotons. Again, I think Hiroshima was like a 60 kiloton uh, type bomb. So we're dealing with something that would, would wipe out essentially one, two, three square miles of a city. But of course, you could have multiple suitcase bombs and, and you're likely to see, you know, great panic. You're likely to see uh, martial law. So you're going to see all these kinds of things occur. And then supposedly what happens after that is within several months, there would be a surprise attack in which there will be an all out first strike uh, by Russian missiles uh, from their subs from their silos, uh, and they have a lot of new technology. I'm actually working on a follow-up to this book with a couple of, of folks, one who's actually spent 20 years of his of his life studying uh, U.S.-Russian relations and has extensive contacts in the Kremlin, frankly, as well as on the oh, ground wow. in the Ukraine. And so, so there's probably a lot more to be said, and hopefully we'll get a chance to say that in the weeks ahead. But um, you've got these kinds of things are likely to be the way it would happen. Now, the Bible seems to suggest that as Gog and Magog, and presuming for a moment that that is Russia and Iran or Persia and different African nations, Muslim nations, and so forth, that as they come against Israel and as they move onto the mountains of Israel, it says in the scripture that they are utterly destroyed, but not until they have launched attacks against those that dwell safely in the coastlands that attack the land of unwalled villages. And a lot of people think that's Israel. I, I happen to believe that that's probably the new world. It's probably 
cities in America, the daughter of Babylon, which seems to be corroborated by the way uh, the verses are set up and structured in Jeremiah, again, Jeremiah 50 and 51, Isaiah 13, um, Psalm 137, I believe it is, Zechariah 6. There's a series of places that talk about the daughter of Babylon. And for folks that are interested just in that issue, the book that we wrote and published two years ago, The Final Babylon, gets into great detail about why America is the daughter of Babylon. The miss, It is really the, the run-up to Mystery Babylon, or it's a subset of Mystery Babylon, uh, talked about in Revelation. And, and so it's a, you know, we would expect that, that the Battle of Gog and Magog would lead to a rapid uh, exchange of fire between um, Russia and the United States. Um, I believe it's Jeremiah, but I could be it could be Isaiah that talks about the the arrows that are fired from this nation, and every arrow hits its target is what it says. No arrows miss. And it appears that um, during this Gog and Magog war, the scripture is explicit. Israel is protected by God. Israel does not suffer, does not suffer. Instead, five-sixths of the armies of Gog and Magog, and it appears five-sixths of the population of this nation or a series of nations are destroyed by this war. But prior to their destruction, they have destroyed the daughter of Babylon. And so it looks like that you could have in a very rapid succession in a matter of perhaps very few days, you could have the destruction of the United States and you could have the destruction of Russia. Um, and what that leaves you with then is Europe and the kings of the East. And so the old scenario, how Lindsay architected back in 1970, which has really been talked about since 1850, I think it was. There was a, uh, a Hebrew scholar named uh, Jacinius that wrote in like 1847 or whatever and talked about Gog and Magog, talked about it being Russia um, and how this scenario would play out. And the reason that he knew so much about it is because Ezekiel is so explicit and yeah. Jeremiah is explicit about what happens in this war. And this is the war that transpires just in a, within a few years, whether it's three and a half years or seven years, it's not much more than that before Jesus returns visibly and physically uh, to the world. So it is, uh, and, the, and, and the Orthodox Jews have always said, you know, the, the war of Gog and Magog is the, is the Messianic war. It's the war that leads to the coming of the Messiah. And so, um, so we, we believe that this could all happen very rapid succession. And, um, and that, that, that is what is predicted in Ezekiel and Jeremiah. And so then the real question is, well, all right, all oh, that's all well and good. But is there a reason why that's going to happen sooner rather than later? Right. So I'm actually asking you a straight question for you to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it actually works out because that, that sort of was my next question. Oh, okay. Uh, the next question that I had was, uh, you know, what do you believe the, the true motives of the world leaders behind these types of decisions are, you know, today as opposed to, you know, 5, 10, 20 years from now. So uh, very intuitive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, the, you know, the short answer, uh, which I'll, we'll just use as kind of the, the teaser, is that there's a good argument that this needs to happen in the next three to five years uh, for a number of geopolitical and economic reasons. However, let's set that aside for a second. Let's talk about, let's talk about geopolitics for a second, what's been going on. Um, Putin, you know, basically Russia in 1991, the, uh, the Soviet Union came to an end. You, you went through a, a, a time of turmoil. Eventually, it led to Boris Yeltsin becoming the president. He appointed a series of oligarchs or very wealthy, very corrupt individuals, and they were running 
in effect, they were the Russian mafia that we talk about. The old James Bond movie, Pierce Brosnan's first James Bond movie, dealing with the, the Russian mob and so forth in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. Uh, well, that was kind of what was going on. But in 1995, you had this guy named Vladimir Putin from St. Petersburg who had been in the KGB for many years and had worked in uh, East Germany, uh, what was, you know, had become, it had been formerly East Germany until the wall, uh, East until the wall in Berlin fell down. Well, anyway, he, um, you had the movement from what was known formerly as the KGB in the Soviet Union to the FSB, which was really the Russian KGB that uh, Putin was still involved in. Um, Putin was, was basically a protege of Yeltsin. Yeltsin was a drunkard. There were some things that he did that were good. Um, but essentially he was setting up, uh, for Putin to come in and take over. And about the year 2000, Yeltsin steps down, uh, Putin wins an election, probably due to some false flag things that he was pulling off in Chechnya by having some apartments blown up and creating war in Chechnya. Um, but long story short there, Putin, Putin wins the election. And so Putin begins to, to restructure what's happening in, in Russia. The oligarchs uh, that ran various businesses, the oil industry, travel industry, whatever, he eases them out, sometimes not so easily, throws them out, ships them off to Siberia. Uh, they flee, they go to England, whatever. And so you've got this radical transformation that occurs in Russian society in this sort of 2000 to 2006, 2007 time frame, there's this great big, a bunch of turnover. And, and you got, you know, uh, Putin, and then he had this Medvedev, which was this other guy. Putin served two terms, had Medvedev come in, he served a term, and then Putin came back in, got reelected, and so Putin's the president once again. So, you know, in theory, this could kind of go on for as long as they want wanted to go on. Um, but Putin has been the strong man that's really been driving Russia since about the year 2000. And Putin is a nationalist versus a globalist. Our political leaders, this is part of your question in terms of, you know, kind of who are the players and the elite and all that. The new world order is a, is a Western concept. It's, it's really you know, there's the Illuminati and there's the elite and all that, but essentially, it's it's what we'd call the trilateralist or the uh, the Westerners. It's essentially the Europeans, the Americans, and the Japanese, and the Japanese essentially have been shills for America since World War II. Uh, very smart, but still, nevertheless, under the thumb of America uh, since that period of time, and uh, and so the New World Order. Uh, George H. W. Bush talks about this, you know, a 911 10 years before 911 uh, occurs. Talks about there's an opportunity for a new world order. Well, you know, this has been what America has been pushing for with the League of Nations, with the United Nations, and now the new world order. Vladimir Putin wants nothing to do with the new world order. He is a nationalist. He wants to see Russia return to its greatness. He has more or less repudiated at at least at a public level, the concept of Leninism, Marxism, and all that. Now, there are those that believe that under the underneath a conspiracy theorist that there really is still this, the perestroika deception that this is all, you know, a charade that the, the same people that ran the Soviet Union are still, you know, they're the people behind the curtain still sort of pulling the strings. That might be true. I, I think it's kind of, it's kind of not that important whether it is true or it isn't true. It's, we kind of have to focus on what we can demonstrate is provable and documentable. And what we can see is that Putin wants to being, uh, bring back Russia to a great um, national world power. And, and so he has been hoping that he could do that through an economic plan of using Russia's vast uh, natural resources. It's oil and gas, uh, natural gas, it's oil, uh, uranium, all these precious metals um, to put Russia into really the catbird seat 
regarding uh, bringing revenues into the country. Um, Russia makes over 50% of its revenue through the sale of its resources, its fossil fuels. And Russia, though, in the last 12, 18 months, has been hurt dramatically by the sanctions that the United States and Europe has imposed upon Russia, the fall of or the collapse of the ruble, which lost almost 80% of its value back in 2014, and falling oil and gas prices. Now, one of the real interesting questions is, why did oil and gas fall? Well, it, it seems to have been the result of the Saudis, what they did. The question is, were they trying to destroy the American oil and gas economy because of fracking, because we were generating so much more oil out of, uh, out of existing known areas where we drilled before by using fracking technology, which is expensive. Um, you know, so the price of gas has to be at a certain level, closer to $4 a gallon. You know, here in Oklahoma, where I'm living now, gas is about two fifty a gallon. You know, I don't know what it is in Michigan where you live, but it's a lot less than it was two years ago. Yeah. And it has a, it has a big impact upon Russia. So Russia has lost a dramatic amount of its revenues. And unlike the United States, Russia can't just print money because Russia, the ruble is not a world is not the world reserve currency the way that the US dollar is. And that's another of course another whole story about why the US it's a rigged uh, playing field for the United States because the United States has the reserve currency, uh, the Federal Reserve, the international bankers. You know, we really sort of run the show. So, and then we also have things set up where we basically force people to buy our treasuries. You know, we we create the world police force, the world military, the 900 to 1,000 military bases, all these carrier groups, all these submarines, but. The gun that we hold to the head of the rest of the world is that this costs a lot of money. We run deficits because of it. Uh, we want to sell you our military weapons, and which we do, uh, but you got to buy our U.S. treasuries to sort of make the balance of payments work out the way that it does. So it bolsters our dollar and keeps the dollar as, in effect, the, the world currency. Well, Russia doesn't want that either. So Russia has been trying to work with China, with India, with South Africa. Um, and with um, India, that's called the BRICS, B-R-I-C-S, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Uh, and they're trying to create an alternative to the New World Order and to the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. International Monetary Fund, the World Bank are as global as Federal Express is federal. In other words, they're really run by Western bankers, predominantly Anglo-Americans, uh, Wall Street, and the city of London. And, and so Russia is at a big disadvantage there as well. So what you have in terms of, a, of a, the scenario is you have economic, you have an economic uh, clock ticking. Russia is hurting economically with the sanctions, the falling oil prices, uh, the, the valuation of the ruble. You've got consumer confidence in Russia is falling. Uh, the ruble doesn't buy as much as it did before. And so there's a lot of economic pressure on Russia. Russia clearly is not the economic power the United States is, not even close. Um, but one thing Russia has, nuclear weapons. Right. And they have nuclear weapons that are as good or better than ours. And they have more of them. And based upon what many believe is true about their strategy and their plan, they're willing to use them if they feel like that is the only way they can win the battle between East and West. And that seems to be where we're heading. That seems to be what they may be believing is that they're running out of time if they don't act they are going to find themselves in an increasingly difficult situation where the U.S., where NATO stacks up more and more weapons right on their borders. We increase the sanctions. We put them in a greater and greater uh, disadvantage, and Russia gets carved up and broken up, and the vision of a great Russia that Putin has in, has in mind can no longer occur. And then the last thing I'll talk about, kind of in answering this sort of this overall geopolitical 
you know, sort of the, the status of things is there's this thing called the color revolutions. And color revolutions are a term that the media has been using really for 15 years or longer. I, I really wasn't that familiar with it until I started studying this. But it's uh, it works very nicely for propaganda for the Russians. The Russians believe the color revolutions, they are non-military interventions or government regime changes that have been occurring in literally dozens of countries over the past 20 years, sort of at the time, before, during, and then certainly after the, uh, the, the breakup of the Soviet Union uh, to uh, create regimes that are friendly to the United States. That, uh, you know, and so the, for instance, the Ukraine had a revolution called the Orange Revolution in 2004. This is when uh, Viktor Yushchenko and Viktor, um, uh, you're in, you, 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 I, I have, I'm struggling with his name right now, UNESCO, uh, you're UNESCO. I have to go, I have to go look at the name because it's difficult. But anyway, there are two Viktors. One was westward leaning, which was Yushchenko. Uh, and the other victor was leaning towards Moscow. And he was, in fact, the president um, in the Ukraine, in Kiev, which is sort of in western Ukraine, which leans to the western world, in February of 2014 when there was a revolution. And he was not willing to go along with the general consensus amongst the politicians in the Ukraine that they wanted to become part of NATO, part of the EU. Instead, um, he wanted to be more associated with Moscow and the uh, economic alliance of uh, Russia, Belarus, China, the Eurasians, and so forth. And, and so there, there was this conflict in February 21st, 20th, 21st, 2014. And this is where there were several hundred people that were killed in riots in, uh, in Kiev. He was ousted. He fled to uh, Moscow. And once again, the, um, the more, um, I would call them almost fascist, um, politicians uh, in the Ukraine that were westward leaning, and many of them had historical roots associated with the Nazis because they were collaborators with the Nazis during the Second World War. And again, you get into all kinds of history and historical things going on. So you've got you got the eastern Ukrainians and the and Crimea, which is in the southeast. They mostly speak Russian. They are native Russians that were migrated in to the Ukraine over the last 100 to 200 years. And then you have more native Ukrainians in central and western Ukraine. Kiev is almost dead center, but they are interested more in associations with Europe. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, th that's kind of the, the political situation. But the color revolutions, there was the Orange Revolution in, in 2004. Um, there's been the Green Revolution, so-called, in Iran. There was the, I think it's called the, um, um, the Lotus Revolution in Egypt, which was the Morsi uh, thing that happened in, um, uh, in Ta uh, Tamir Square. I can't, I have to remember all these names. And, uh, and so you've got, if you look at the map, which is one of the maps I show in the book, um, you see dozens of countries you see all of these revolutions, and the point is, is that the Russians are saying, these are not revolutions that we have fomented. These are revolutions that the CIA has fomented. These are revolutions that the United States is pushing to allow the United States to basically build its economic alliances across the Middle East, North Africa, Eastern Europe, and so on. And so the Russians are arguing. Now, this is not necessarily true, but it is what they are saying. And it could be partially true. There could also be a combination of which 
Many of the color revolutions are in fact happening due to US influence, but many others are happening due to Russian influence. And so there is a sort of non-military, uh, we're going to go in, we're going to create unrest, we're going to bring people in to riot in the streets, we're paying them to come in to riot in the streets, you know, they're, they're not really authentically demonstrating against the government because of their problems, they're not even natives to the land. And so you've kind of got this stuff going on all over the world. What it leads to though, is it leads to the Russians having a moral an argument for them taking the moral high ground and that it's the United States and the evil West that has been living and running their economy in a state of war continuously since World War II and the Russians are the good guys trying to liberate the all of these other nations from Americans that all we care about is we want to sell weapons and we want to create more and more wars. And they're, they're not necessarily completely wrong about that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's the, the dilemma that I've been talking about in the final Babylon, America's the daughter of Babylon, is that America has problems, not just because of moral you know, it's not just our, that our immorality, the fact that we export a great deal of pornography and that we have all these moral problems. It's also the fact that we genuinely are a war-based economy and we have oppressed and suppressed third world nations through our USAID programs and so forth, different ways to influence and to hold hostage third world countries. And we have definitely created uh, distress and we've created wars in order to be able to sell equipment, the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about. So this is the, this is the bigger backdrop. This is not what you're really hearing in the news. The focus on the news is the Iranian nuclear deal. You know, that's yeah. a big issue, right? We talk about that. Uh, we talk about ISIS, mm -hmm. but the real greatest existential threat, and it was said just uh, a week ago by the new uh, general that is, uh, has been appointed, still has to get through congressional confirmation. I don't know if it's Dunbar, I can't think of his name right off, right off the bat, but uh, he indicated that Russia, not ISIS, not Iran, but Russia is the greatest existential threat to the United States. And on July 1st, the United States, the Pentagon released a new war strategy document. And all of a sudden, the emphasis was not on ISIS. It wasn't on terrorism. It was on potential nuclear war with the Russians. Wow. So there is a, there is a sea change that is occurring and that has been transpiring. And so it is, uh, as I, as I document and continue to, you know, my blog, write different blogs on this stuff, the, the world is changing. And because of these economic pressures, um, something could happen. We haven't even talked right now about conventional weapons and how, how far Russia's behind on conventional weapons. They have some great tanks. They have some great airplanes. They just don't have very many of them because they can't afford very many of them. But uh, how will how will that mm -hmm. uh, how will that factor in? Well, essentially, it becomes a non-factor if Russia decides that there's no reason to use tactical nuclear devices against NATO or the United States in the European theory, uh, theater. Instead, the real battle should be a strategic strategic um, first strike surprise attack on the American homeland. And if that occurs, that's, that's where they can essentially, uh, win the war. They can destroy us in a matter of hours, um, such that even though our economy may be, let's say 10 times stronger than theirs, and it's probably 25 times stronger than theirs in a few hours, they can basically make their economy stronger than ours because they can wipe out dozens and dozens of our cities. And so that, that's, the, that's the strategic question 
that Putin is going to have to deal with in the next, I'd say, two to three years. Because three years from now, four years from now, five years from now, it becomes more difficult. The United States will catch wind of this. We will get more prepared. We will think more in terms of we will pay attention to what he's saying that he could do with nuclear weapons. And economically, we absolutely are far stronger than they are, despite our national debt and so forth. Uh, we, I mean, we have a game. The national debt is, to some extent, it's a non-issue. I know that sounds crazy to say, but because we can print our way out, we can devalue the dollar, all of the debt we have. You know, we cut the value of the dollar in half, we cut our debt in half. I mean, right. it, you know, there's, there's basically ways that we can trick up the system because we are at the center of the way the system works. And the Russians can't do that. And so, um, so there is pressure for a decision to be made and some steps to potentially be taken in the next couple of years. And that's why I'm sort of sounding the alarm because within our eschatology community, they're really, there's a lot more emphasis on kind of the X-Files stuff. Now, you, right. and I both, you and I both write about X-Files stuff, and we like X-Files stuff. But to some extent, if, if Russia attacks the United States in the next two to three years, all that kind of becomes less important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of becomes not the issue. And, um, and so, you know, granted, transhumanism is a, is a dramatic issue if we live till 2045. Uh, right. you know, but if we live only to 2020, uh, it doesn't really matter so much. And so that's kind of the, the, the warning I'm attempting to sound right now. Well, that's great. It's definitely an, an issue that should be at the, the forefront. And, and, you know, th this is one thing that I'm really glad that you've emphasized a lot uh, throughout your ministry is where America actually is in the Bible. Because I know that's a a controversial view, and um, I, I remember my, my very first book, uh, Disclosure, I, I wrote a little bit about that, where America is in the Bible, and mm -hmm. um, but th then, you know, when uh, Final Babylon and all that, all your stuff came out, I, I learned so much more. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit um, in the Bible about America, but, it, you know, still a lot of people aren't, aren't convinced right. of that. And, yeah. and possibly, yeah. probably even some people, you know, watching the show. So I, I wanted to ask if you could go through some of the Bible passages that actually do talk mm -hmm. about America and what mm -hmm. your evidence is uh, that it's the daughter of Babylon and what the Bible actually says about the daughter of Babylon. Yeah, let me bring up um, because I, I, unfortunately I don't have everything memorized. Let me uh, let me bring up my uh, uh, my book because I can talk through some of the verses a little bit better um, and and kind of point out some of those things. But it's it's certainly the case. I would encourage people to go off uh, to Amazon and just look at the reviews uh, of the Final Babylon. There's something like eighty some reviews, and just read what people say. What you're going to discover is that. Very, very few people are disagreeing with us now about right. the Bible as, you know, that the United States is, uh, is the daughter of Babylon. You're seeing a lot of people agree now that that, that really is the case. And, of course, as we argue in that book, uh, we're hardly alone. I mean, there's um, – back in the 1960s, a guy named Frank Logston, who was the pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago, very famous evangelical uh, church. Uh, he talked about this. Noah Hutchings, who just passed away a few – uh, a few weeks ago, he passed away at like 92. He had been talking about this for many years. Um, you know, Tom Horn in his book, uh, talking about the Polyon rising in 2012, uh, very strong undercurrent that America really is at the core of this whole issue of mystery Babylon. Um, I call it sort of the dirty dozen. There's a whole bunch of us. Uh, you know, the late J.R. Church talked about this. Um, so there's a lot of us that have said, uh, it's not the majority view uh, historically because, you know, the, the traditional conventional view of Hal Lindsey, Tilden LaHaye, the late great Jeffrey, uh, and Chuck Missler to some extent, although Missler is changing his view now, um, that, um, you know, that the, Rome, the revived Roman Empire would be the power base of the Antichrist. And we, of course, right. disagree. We're saying, no, the power base of the Antichrist, if the Lord returns in the next 10 15 years, it 
that it has to be America. There really is no one else that could qualify. Um, and now, you know, if America is destroyed in some type of attack, then yeah, all of a sudden, you know, there's a possibility that uh, several European nations step up. Uh, the King of England becomes, you know, potentially the Antichrist and all that. But we don't know that that's exactly how it's going to play out. So, but anyway, the going to specifically your question about some of the verses. Um, yeah, there's there's definitely some verses we can talk about. Let me uh, let me shoot over and talk about. A lot of these are built around uh, Jeremiah chapter fifty fifty one, as I as I indicated. I'm trying to get my uh, my software to compo- to cooperate here. In terms of here we go, um, the the phrase the daughter of Babylon, you see this in um, for instance Psalm 137, uh, daughter of Babylon who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. That this sort of refers to the possibility that the daughter of Babylon has in fact betrayed the nation of Israel, which. Right now, if one looks at what's going on with the United States and Iran and Israel, one might say, gee, maybe America is betraying Israel. Uh, yes. Isaiah, Isaiah 47 one says, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. That was the land of Babylon. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Um, sit in silence. Go into darkness, daughter of the Babylonians. No more will you be called a queen of the kingdoms. This sort of queen, Babylon, the queen, the daughter of Babylon, kind of ties into the daughter of Tyre, the daughter of Tarshish, to the whore of of Babylon in Revelation. Uh, You see these themes, and we talk about those in uh, the final Babylon. Uh, Isaiah 13, in Babylon, the glory of kingdoms. The beauty of the Chaldeans' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Well, that couldn't be Babylon, you know, from, in effect, the Old Testament, uh, because after the Old Testament was completed in about the 5th century B.C., Alexander the Great, conquered Babylon and Babylon was his was his capital and Babylon continued right. to exist for hundreds of more years um, today of course Babylon is is basically little more than a Disneyland outside of Baghdad uh, but there are many that argue that Babylon will be rebuilt and will be the world power will be the capital of the Antichrist I think that is uh, is not not true and will not happen. But if the Lord tarries for 50 to 100 more years, then it could be true. I just don't believe that right. there's a likelihood that that will, that will be the case. Um, now jumping into Jeremiah. Um, let's see. They shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses. Everyone put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. Uh, goes on, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. It is time to thresh her. The time of her harvest shall come. Um, then in Zechariah 2.7, deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwelleth with the daughter of Babylon. So there's this concept of the daughter of Babylon. Uh, it talks about the fact that it will be destroyed. Uh, and then it gives very specific attributes. Let me go through some of those attributes. Uh, Jeremiah fifty twelve says it is called the hindermost of nations. Well, what does hindermost means? Hindermost means sort of the last in the series, the younger, uh, the youngest, uh, perhaps the last, in the youngest empire. Uh, it appears, therefore, to be the world's final giant empire before Jesus Christ uh, comes to set up His kingdom, what we call the millennial kingdom. Jeremiah also calls it in Jeremiah 50, 23, he calls the daughter of Babylon the hammer of the whole earth, meaning that it has a military power that is global. It has the ability to project power anywhere in the world. No one's ever been able to do that but one country, the United States. Right. It's also in Jeremiah 50, 12, uh, 5037 and Jeremiah 51 13 it is called the richest nation in the world the, the nation basically dictates terms worldwide 
here's some really interesting uh, verses. Jeremiah 50, uh, 37. It's composed of a mingled people. Oh, wow. <laughs> the people not of a single race, but of many races. In effect, it's a melting pot. All right. Now, if that wasn't specific enough, uh, yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can go on to, uh, to, to the next verse here. Let's see if I can go, if I can get my, my, uh, I'm gonna have to go back and do it this way. <laughs> yeah. Then I can, then I can get there. All right. I'm having a hard time just getting my uh, computer to cooperate. Um, let's see. It might be da, 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 da. All right now I'll try to get there with this and just trying to get this so I can read these because of my, because my eyes, as I get old, it's harder to read these. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, how about this? It is a nation living on many waters. Jeremiah 51, 13. Uh, this likely means that it's surrounded by oceans. It's traversed by large rivers and perhaps it even has great lakes of fresh water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, it's a nation that has mounted up to the heavens. What other nation other than the United States has mounted up to heavens? Anywhere from the moon to doing a flyby of the planet Pluto just in the last right. week. Right. Yeah, and absolutely. The sky is no limit. Jeremiah 51.4, the nations of the world flow unto him. They stream unto him. All the nations of the world meet in this city or in this nation. Sounds like New York City, doesn't it? United Nations. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It was once a golden cup in the hands of the Lord, but it's now identified as a cup of sin and immorality, a cup, a cup of filthiness, or as my, my co-author Doug Krieger likes to say, a cup of putridities. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and then we see a number of verses, I think it's six or seven times, the people of God are warned to flee Babylon, Jeremiah 50, verse 8, 50, verse 28, 51, verse 6. It suggests that it's a nation that has many Jews. All right, let's think for a second. ISIS has essentially driven all the Jews out of Iraq. So, yes, there is Babylon in Iraq. How many Jews live in Babylon? The answer Virtually is zero. Not. Yeah. Virtually none. And how many live in Iraq? The answer is virtually none. Mm -hmm. How many Jews live in the United States? Over six million. Yeah, how a many lot. Jews? How many Jews live in Israel? Over six million. Essentially, half of the Jewish population lives in Babylon right now. Okay, um, so fleeing Babylon is a is a real clue, um, and it says in Jeremiah fifty one forty nine that it will betray the people of God. I argue that that is happening as we speak, that the Absolutely. current administration has been betraying Israel. Just listen to Netanyahu. The guy has become apoplectic over this whole issue of the Iran nuclear deal, and he's certainly not alone. So you have, um, you know, a, a number of things here. There's over 60, I think it's over 60 attributes. There's a few more. Um, your mother shall be sorely confounded. She that bore you shall be ashamed. Behold, the hindermost of nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land and the desert. Well, the mother that could be confounded could easily be understood to be England. Yeah. <laughs> that her lion cub, uh, you know, that there's talk about the eagle and the eagle's wings being plucked. Um, yeah. Isaiah 18, don't even talk about Isaiah 18, talks about this land or this nation that sends ambassadors all over the world and serves as sort of the political controller, if you will, of, of the politics. And then there are many uh, verses in Jeremiah that talk about the destruction. For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert, of an expert man. None shall return in vain. Could that possibly be Russia? Could it be their missiles, that their missiles hit yeah. their targets? I think it could. Certainly Gary Sturman wrote an article on that a number of months ago, talked about, talked about that. Um, because of the wrath of the Lord, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. 
Everyone that goeth by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all her plagues. The predictions, Isaiah uh, 13, 9 also says, it will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, what is the nature of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, if we look at the Dead Sea, we see what? It's probably Sodom and Gomorrah was probably buried under the Dead Sea or completely obliterated by it. The predictions are that the nation, the daughter of Babylon, will be utterly destroyed such that it will be uninhabitable for generation to generation to generation. Some say it will never be inhabited again. Um, that We're not dealing with Iraq, which is part of the nation of Israel in the nation of Israel's millennial kingdom. Right can't be Iraq. It can't be Babylon. It has to be a different nation. Well, yeah, that's a really yeah, good point. You know, um, So I can go on. There's more. A sound of battle in the land uh, of great destruction. Uh, how is the hammer of the whole earth cut asunder and broken? How has Babylon become a desolation among the nations? And so on and so on and so on. And when one goes and looks, as I said earlier, at Ezekiel and reads Ezekiel 39 and specifically, you see a lot of the verses, they tend to map to the same concepts as in Jeremiah. And so that's why uh, I'm arguing that, yes, Russia is destined to nuke the United States. It's not a happy thought. Um, it it dis greatly disturbs me. And the fact that it could happen in the next few years um, should cause all of us to fall to our knees and begin to pray and ask the Lord if there is a way that this disaster can be averted. Um, now, some would say, well, of course, the rapture is going to come. The rapture is going to save us. Well, I got news for you. We might still believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. We still might say, well, the rapture is going to occur, you know, at least seven years before Christ physically returns with the saints to the Mount of Olives. It doesn't mean the rapture is going to happen before America is judged. Right. America can be judged um, before the rapture occurs, and the rapture still could be a pre-tribulation rapture. Um, judgment begins on the house of God. You know, Second Peter talks about that. You see that, uh, you know, in the story in Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is told to go out and mark the different, uh, the old people, the people that are lamenting and wailing because of what's happened in the apostasy of Israel. And the first ones that are uh, dealt with are the ones that are nearest the temple. They're the ones that are um, nearest to the house of the Lord. God deals with us first. He wants us to repent, and then he wants us to pray for our nation, just like Daniel did. Daniel was a man virtually without sin, and he prayed, what, three times a day? Or was it five times a day? I'm not sure. Right. It was Jerusalem, and, and he confessed the sins of his nation, and he identified himself with his nation and with their sins, and he pleaded uh, on their behalf. That's something that I think, you know, as I— as I share this message and preach this message, I intend to convey to people, this is not just information and knowledge for you to sort of know about and go, wow, this is something that we're to do something with. We are to pray. We should be praying for Putin that he won't make these decisions. We should be praying for our country that we will do what we need to do to prepare ourselves to make it look uh, like a very bad idea to attack us. Um, we should be praying that this could be averted. Uh, I would like nothing better than what I'm suggesting is going to happen for me to be completely wrong. Um, but the reality is that I may not be completely wrong, that after about 40 years of study, and discussions with quite a number of people and more of those discussions to come that this is a scenario that that could be facing us just again in the next two to three years wow. so it should be it should be a very sobering thought for us yeah yeah absolutely and um I, I, you know that that that's we we definitely need to pray i mean even if uh there are you know viewers and listeners that don't buy into this scenario 
mm-hmm. like you said, you might not be wrong. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. there's so it, it's e- either way. It's something that we definitely need to pray about. What 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 else can uh you know we as Christians uh what what else can we do to prepare for what may be ahead? I I mean it it seems it seems like the seems like uh, parts of the Bible are saying to just get out. So I mean, do we move out of America or do we uh? Stockpile some food, you know. What, what kinds of uh, things well, beyond? <laughs> a lot beyond of a lot of people talk yeah. about prepping, right? You know, and I I really think that for me, um, prepping gets down to spiritual preparation. Um, yeah. And and I'm not going to tell people, you know, don't stockpile some food and some water and all that. I live in Oklahoma, and you know, we have tornadoes every so often. And we need to sort of stockpile some food and water just for that. Yeah. Because can, we can lose, you know, access to all those things for a couple of weeks down here. But um, you, you got to be mindful of something, you know. Um, if you're a Christian, you've prepared for your family, and you've even decided that, you know, the tribulation is going to last seven years, and you're going to have to live through the whole thing. Uh, what are you going to do when neighbors come and they want food and they're starving to death or their baby's dying from malnutrition? Are you going to offer them nothing? Um, guess what? If you don't offer them something, you've, you're no longer a Christian. Now, I'm not saying you've right. lost your salvation, but you know, but you have reason to question whether you ever were saved if you do that, because that's what Jesus taught us. And so, yeah, you know, you're going to take a gun, you're going to shoot somebody if they if they want some of your food. So we have to have a very different outlook. We have to have an outlook. I think, um, like the Jews were taught. Every day, when they were in the wilderness, the Lord's going to provide you manna. <laughs> you yes. know, and and I'm and the Lord said, "Don't store it; it will rot. It will go bad every day. I will take care of you. I will provide for you." Now, am I saying that we can all expect that to occur? I think some of us can. I think it depends on what the Lord's plan for each of us is. Um, and will we be here during the tribulation? Well. I don't happen to believe we'll be here during the Great Tribulation, but I don't know exactly when the Tribulation begins. Is there a seven-year period? Yeah, I think there's a seven-year period. Uh, the Antichrist confirms a you know, covenant for seven years, halfway through, breaks the covenant. Seems That seems to begin the so-called Great Tribulation, the Abomination of Desolation. Will we be raptured before that? I think there's a good argument that we will be, but between now and then, there could be, and probably will be, significant persecution. What's been happening with decisions of the Supreme Court, the implications for the church, you know, we could be facing some very, very difficult times. Obviously, if you live in the Middle East, uh, if you're a Yazidi, or if you're a Christian, or even if you're a, a Muslim that doesn't happen to believe the way ISIS believes, uh, you're going through a lot of tribulation right now, too. You may have lost your head. You may have your family may have been kidnapped, your, your women relatives sold into slavery, and so on. So the tribulation is, you know, is all around us. just doesn't happen to be in the United States at this very moment. But it could happen. It could happen very rapidly. Just think if those suitcase nukes go off, what's going to happen? Is it going to be martial law? It's going to be almost immediate. Um, are Christians going to be blamed for it? Very likely. Nero blamed the Christians for the you know the burning of Rome, right? It was all the Christians' right. fault. All of a sudden, he decided to start using Christians as his, uh, as his personal Roman candles, you might say. Yeah. <laughs> Started putting them on fire just just to be able to have a feast and banquets at night. So I guess that would be the original Roman candle, wouldn't it? Um, right. <laughs> so so things can happen. So you know I think everyone has to has to be open and be in prayer and has to make decisions what they believe the Lord is calling them to do as it relates to preparations. But for the most part. I believe that as Christians, we need to understand we're going to be entering into a dramatically different time in which the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be like we have never witnessed up to this point in time, or at least not most of us have not witnessed it. And the the greater works that Jesus said that, that we shall do because he goes to be with the Father, we're going to see those kinds of things happen, I believe. We're going to see some yeah. incredible miracles. I think we've got to begin to think in terms of the fact that that 
status quo is not going to be the status quo anymore. Things are going to change. And, uh, and so we have to begin to look to and expect God to be with us every day. You know, interesting verse. I was talking with Larry Spargimino, Southwest Radio Church. This last week we did some interviews that will be uh, on his radio program here in a couple of weeks. And, and one of the things that really struck me is from 1 John 4. This is a dark message, what I'm sharing. It's obviously um, frightening, scary. Uh, you, like me, you know, you have young children. I have a young grandchild. I don't want them to grow up in this kind of a world. I want them to have a nice, long, great, wonderful life. Um, so there's no, there's no rejoicing in this. Yes, I want the Lord to come back soon, and I want to be with the Lord, and I want to be with relatives that have gone on ahead of us, but, but it's not my desire that these things happen. But you know what the, the Scripture teaches us? How to overcome fear? It is, we overcome fear by being more and more immersed in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. It's First John 4. And those that fear have a fear of the judgment. And that's a, a fascinating connection that those, that that passage makes. But as we have Christ dwell in us more and more, Christ, it says, casts out that fear. He expels it. He, it's like it's jettisoned, it's eradicated, it's eliminated from us. And so I believe that we, we have to be more filled with the love of God for our fellow Christians, for our enemies. If we love more perfectly, we will not experience fear. We will be brave, courageous, and able to deal with these difficult days that lie ahead. And so that's a message that I believe the Lord has given me that as we talk about these dire circumstances that could be facing us, we also need to be preparing ourselves to realize that the way we can get our minds and our hearts quiet and at rest as we trust in Christ Jesus is to recognize that Christ needs to dwell in us more fully and that perfect love will cast out fear. For God is love, and as God dwells in us, that fear will be eliminated. Amen. I couldn't have said that better myself. Yeah, I I, I absolutely agree, and uh, you know that, that's one of the one of the things that I really like about doing shows like this is even when there's a you know a darker message or or something to be to be prepared for or aware of, there's always a way around the fear, you know, there, there's, there's hope, there's hope in Christ. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's, there's hope in Christ. And I, I love having, I guess that bring that up. Um, one, one thing that we do throughout this, uh, show is late, lately we've been doing viewer questions and, uh, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so some of the viewers of the show sent in some questions and, and for, for new viewers of the show, uh, if you go to Facebook, uh, there's the sharpening Facebook group, uh, you can either search for the sharpening on Facebook, or if you go to ministry.com, there's a link uh, to the group on the sidebar. And ma make sure you join the group, because uh, before I have any guests on, I give viewers and listeners the opportunity to send in questions that uh, they would like to for me to ask on the show. So, uh, Doug, we have a... We have about three or four of these. Uh, do you mind? Uh, mind if I ask? No, I'd love that. Be lo that'd be great. Let's do that. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and I, I, I only use first names on here so as to not embarrass Probably anybody. Probably a good idea. No, yeah, keep the, you know, protect the innocent and incriminate the guilty, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so the uh, first question comes from Frank, and uh, Frank okay. asks, quite simply, uh, when will it happen? I know we kind of already touched on that. I, I, I'm assuming he's referring to the actual nuclear attack on the uh, right. U.S. from Russia. Uh, right. Uh, we, we kind of already touched on it, but I'll let you. Yeah, I, I, just to recap, I think that, I mean, you know, it, it might not happen at all. It might not happen for 50 years. But right. there are geopolitical and economic reasons to suggest that it, it, that it could happen within the next three years, the next four years. But it can't, it, it, if it happens, in other words, it's more likely to happen in the next three years than it is to likely happen 10 years from now. And that has to do with just the the issue of the you know economics, um, the issue of weapons preparations, surprise, uh, and so on. Uh, Putin, you know, and and sort of his regime 
the consumer pressures that are going on in Russia, will those, you know, will the people, Putin's a very popular with the Russians people. He's far more popular with the Russian people, despite the fact that the economy is a mess than our president is in the United States by yeah. a factor of about two to one in terms of percentage points. And so the people would be behind Putin and they would support him. But two more years, three more years of economic hardship, um, you know, that could change. And uh, the continued sanctions, the United States putting pressure uh, on Russia. Now, an interesting thing to watch as we're, as we're recording this program, the Iranian deal has happened. And it appears that the reason that the Russians supported the deal is that they're going to get the United States to calm the whole situation down in the Ukraine and to let the Russians have control over the eastern and the southeastern portions of the Ukraine. It is likely that, and this is what an article I just read today, it is likely that we have traded, this is almost exactly what Neville Chamberlain did before World War II with Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland. Basically, Chamberlain, the English and the French, gave up Czechoslovakia to Hitler to bring about peace. It's very possible mm -hmm. that we traded away uh, part of the Ukraine to Putin without getting any concurrence from the Ukraine. And that is what the, the current president, Poroshenko, uh, said today in, in the press. And so that bears watching. Um, but once again, that's the kind of mentality that the United States has is that, you know, I think it was Victoria Doolin, who's the assistant secretary of state, you know, it was, it's a mess. I mean, that stuff that we are dictating and driving, we're basically telling a sovereign nation what they get to do, how they have to do it, uh, because we are the ones calling the shots. And so right. we may have, in effect, sacrificed them to get Putin to work with us on the Iranian nuclear deal. So I think it's more likely to happen in the short term than it is 10 years from now. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, Michael asks, uh, I, I think this is a question more about your opinion of uh, possible secret technologies. Um, if Russia does nuke the U.S., uh, does the U.S. have any kind of Star Wars defense or uh, of lasers or harp technology uh, to stop them? Uh, what's your opinion on that? I think the answer is it's, it certainly is. It is very likely that some of those weapons do exist. Uh, the U.S. has a pattern of not of not disclosing those kinds of weapons until they're needed. So there is a possibility that that's the case. Um, there are measures and countermeasures. The U.S., um, its detection system is basically satellite-based. Um, there are a number of measures that the, that the Russians can take to send up uh, missiles with small EMP devices that can go off and disable our satellites and blind us to an attack. That could happen very rapidly. Uh, is it possible that the U.S. has laser beam weapons that, in fact, could rapidly shoot down um, Russian missiles? The answer is yes. That was part of the of the um, Star Wars defense initiative that Reagan uh, funded and put in play. But here's what I would say: the Scripture says that that the arrows of this man shall be as a, you know, basically as the superb uh, archer. None of their right. arrows shall return, you know, to him without hitting their targets. And so that's what tells me that while the Lord steps up to protect Israel, which he does, he does not protect the daughter of Babylon. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And that yeah. itself is a very frightening thought, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Regina writes in, uh, I kind of thought Putin was struggling to keep away from the web of bad guys. Glenn Beck did an interesting expose on why Putin disappeared for 10 days and did a play-by-play -play 
since Putin is part of BRICS, isn't he trying to get out from under the yoke of this world control agenda and the banking mm -hmm. systems that go with it? We we touched yes. a little bit on that earlier, but I'll let you. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there was a, an article, uh, another article I read today talking about this, um, that clearly Putin is wanting to break free from the New World Order and from the uh, Anglo-American bankers of Wall Street and, and the City of London uh, and the IMF and the World Bank. He's not wanting to be really uh, held hostage by, uh, by those. Um, you know, a little bit of a contrast here. A lot of people are real enamored with Putin. They think, well, isn't he a great guy? He's, he's real strong and he's a man's man and, and so forth. Well, Putin is a nationalist. Putin may potentially either be or at least think that he is a Christian. He may have repudiated atheism or he may not have. Maybe a total act. All right. I've talked with um, a gentleman we interviewed, actually, that lives in St. Petersburg, which is, of course, where Putin is from. And he said, to, from his standpoint, uh, Putin is Gog and uh, is Gog and Magog, you know, from the land of Magog and, and that it's an act. But, of course, Putin is um, very pro Orthodox, the Orthodox Church, which is sort of the Eastern wing of what you know, the, the Catholic Church was the Roman Catholics and then the Greek Orthodox. And the Russian, historically, uh, Nicholas I, Catherine the Great before uh, Peter the Great, they were historically sort of supporters of the Greek or Russian Orthodox Church. And Putin has sort of embraced that. Um, but is he doing it just as a mechanism kind of replacing Marxism is sort of an ideology that kind of coheres all of Russia sort of together with unity, a little bit like Constantine tried to do with Christianity in the fourth century. You right. know, the answer is, yeah, that's probably what's going on. So, um, you know, but, but Putin is a very corrupt man. Putin, yes, he's a nationalist. Yes, he may have some good elements to him, some things that for us are more appealing than our current president. But he's also a very corrupt man. He, uh, I did a or watched a study on Frontline, a PBS program that I happen to think is is quite excellent from a journalistic standpoint. And it estimated that his net worth is somewhere in the neighborhood of $40 billion, making him one of the probably top 10 richest men in the world. And uh, most of that wealth, though, was accumulated because – he gets not just a taste, he gets the lion's share of uh, all the revenues that come into into Russia from the sale of gas and, uh, you know, oil and so forth. So uh, he structured these deals to be very favorable to himself. So uh, so he's a he's a corrupt guy as well. So, you know, there's it's really hard to find the good guys, you know, the yeah. good guys. You can't hardly find them either way, you know, on either side of this. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, JD wants me to ask, and I, I promised I'd give a shout-out to JD. So, hi, JD. Okay, hi, JD. Uh, J <laughs> yeah. uh, he's, he's a great guy, a good friend. Uh, J JD good. wanted me to ask if you uh, – oh, sorry, what? No, you go ahead. I didn't say anything. Oh, oh sorry about that. I had my screen yeah. up. I wasn't able to see it. Uh, must have no worries. Been something in the headphones. Uh, yeah. But anyway, he wanted me to ask if you if you know of any thwarted nuclear disasters and if the uh, tsunami in, J in the Japan uh, in the ocean could have been possibly an underwater nuke. Um, I haven't read the book. There was supposedly a thwarted nuclear disaster that almost occurred in Arkansas some numbers oh, wow. of years ago, and uh, there's a book that's been written about it that was a Pulitzer Prize winning book that I stumbled across the other day. I haven't read it. I don't know the details about it. Um, I don't know if it was Odessa, Arkansas, but it was some name like that, kind of a European city name, but in Arkansas, and it had to do with a uh, with just barely averting a, a monumental nuclear disaster in the United States. So um, I'm aware that that has occurred. Um, not aware that other than obviously in you know Chernobyl, um, you know years ago, of course, and that by the way is right on the border of northern Ukraine and and Russia. Um, all these cities of great interest are right along the Black Sea, and uh, we didn't talk about the history of uh, of Ukraine and Catherine the Great and why it is the Ukrainians and the Russians hate each other. I talk about that in the book, and it it really is a uh, 
a stunning story and it, it, it gives you a, a real feel for why there is so much animosity. Um, in, in a nutshell, it was because Stalin literally starved to death about 7 million Ukrainians in 1932, 1933. Um, but obviously another story, but there's a lot of reasons why when Putin says that Ukraine and the Crimea is land that the Russians own, there's reasons to say not exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you claim that's the reason, it's because you starved all of our people and you moved Russians into our territory. That's probably not a good reason to claim you have precedence to own Ukraine. But, right. um, but nevertheless, okay. What was the second part of JD's question? Um, let me find it again here. Uh, yeah. Oh, is it possible that the tsunami uh, uh, in the ocean uh, near Japan could have been an underwater nuke? Uh, yeah, anything's possible. Uh, I tend to, I try to dwell more in those things that can be documented, um, right. you know, because there's enough that we can document that should scare us that we don't have to really sit around and worry too much about, you know, what can't be documented. But yeah, there's, you know, there's some things going on. I forgot what the specific issue was between the U.S. and Japan, but there was some, you know, pretty interesting conspiracy theory about how we, uh, you know, sort of we, we somehow caused it to happen. Um, I, I find that hard to believe, but, you know, I, I, I just have, you know, and I think I've, I've been said with you, uh, to you, Josh, you know, pick your conspiracies carefully. Uh, cause yeah. <laughs> you know, there's all, there's, there's lots of conspiracies, but there's only a few that you can afford to sort of chime in and say, yeah, I believe in that conspiracy. So that conspiracy, I don't necessarily find it to be, uh, compelling nor one that's important enough that I want to, that I want to agree with it. Yeah, totally understandable. Uh, well, that is all the viewer questions. Uh, so, Doug, if you if you had to wrap up this entire episode into a final thought, uh, what what would you want the audience to take away from this interview? Um, for the audience, you know, there's I guess I would say I'm kind of on my on my uh, soapbox here. There are a lot of things we study in eschatology, uh, a lot of things that are fascinating. I've written about a wide variety of things. I'm I'm interested in a wide variety of things. Um, this is an area that you should spend some time on, though. This is an area to focus on. This is an area to know about, because if if I am right, there is literally nothing more important that we're studying in eschatology right now than this, because this has the biggest impact upon those of us that live in the United States and, frankly, in the world uh, yeah. in the next few years. And if I'm wrong, and I hope in many ways I hope I am wrong, um, then, you know, all these other things that we talk about that we're fascinated with, transhumanism and, and uh, the potential deception of uh, UFOs and all of these other things, those things kind of come into play more, but, but they may not be as, as much a part of the story um, for the next two or three, four years as they might be 10 years from now or 15 years from now. So I would just say people need to zero in on this. They need to get familiar with the notion of the, the war of Gog and Magog. They need to read and study Jeremiah 50, 51, Ezekiel 38, 39. They need to read, they need to read books like The Final Babylon. Uh, the book that I'm, you know, obviously promoting, you know, Is Russia Destined to Nuke the United States? I will be writing other articles. I've already written three or four um, that supplement the book itself. I'll continue to do that because I'm convinced that is this important. It is that important that we get familiar with it and we share that with our uh, sort of friends, buddies, and other people that we know. It's a, it's a vital, vital issue. Stop debating about when the rapture is going to occur. You know, yeah. focus on um, evangelism. Focus on preparing yourself for the possibility of persecution for the probability of judgment of the United States and the possibility that we may be here when those things occur. Not because, you know, I'm arguing for the pre-wrath or the post-trib rapture. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with just recognizing that the United States has made a number of decisions a lot recently that put us in the crosshairs of the judgment of God. And uh, we need to be praying. We need to be hoping and talking with people. And to the extent we have influence with congressmen, uh, senators, they need to be more alert. Our military needs to be more alert. We need to be aware of these things and concerned with these things. So that's how I'd wrap it up. 
Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. This is definitely some uh, something that I myself am going to keep following as well because it, it is really important. Um, if people would like to know more about you or order your book sure. or uh, follow your blog, where, where can they go? Yeah. Well, first off, um, the book uh, is now available. The printed version of the book is available at Amazon. Um, you can find it uh, Amazon.com. You can do type in S as in Stephen S. Douglas Woodward. Uh, the name of the book is uh, Is Russia Destined to Nuke the U.S.? Um, I encourage you, if you haven't read it, read the book The Final Babylon or kind of a shorter recap of that is the a relatively recent book called Uncommon Sense that is a bit of a recap of a number of my books that fits right into this sort of same storyline. Uh, my website is faith-happens.com. That's uh, faith, F-A-I-T-H, hyphen, happens, H-A-P-P-E-N-S, dot com. Uh, you can also just do a search on uh, S. Douglas Woodward. You'll see I, I do a lot of, have done a lot of videos um, on TV shows and a lot of radio shows uh, out on YouTube, so you can find me there as well. And um, and so you know, I I'm not hard to find. I'm out there. Absolutely, um, yeah. And I, I definitely suggest that people do that because this, this is really important. Um, and I'll I'll definitely have a link to your website in the show notes. And uh, great, but great. yeah. It, it does look like we're we're about all out of time. I want to thank you so much for coming back on the show and sharing your insights. It's uh it's it's been a very good conversation, a uh, you know, definitely a sobering one, but mm -hmm. nevertheless extremely important for the church and uh I can't thank you enough for coming back on and, and no, sharing this with us. Happy happy to do that and and if you have time uh, before you actually post this, tell people how they can uh, invite Christ into their life because it's time to get right with the Lord. I, I, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I, I, actually, that'd be a, a great way to kind of close us out here. Do, do you, do you want to sure. go ahead and share that? Yeah, yeah. So if you're listening to this, uh, or you have a chance to share this with someone that you believe needs to listen to this, um, it's it's uh, there's nothing more important right now than for you to to confront and face up to the realities of these difficult times that we live in, and uh, being a Christian, um, in some ways it it. It's easy. In other ways, it's difficult, but it begins by inviting Jesus Christ to come into your life and to become the Lord of your life and uh, and to let him be empowered, the empowerment to uh, enable you to, to have a transformed life, to help solve the problems of your life and so forth. So um, uh, let's just say a prayer together right now. And, uh, and, and if this is that this is what your heart is telling you, then just pray these words as uh, with me as, as, as I pray with you. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for this opportunity to be together with Josh. We're, we really are uh, challenged by the issues that we face, the, the times at which we live are very difficult, and uh, the threats of what's going on in the world, very concerning. But Lord, it begins uh, by understanding that when you come to live in our life, you bring us hope, you bring us love, and you give us the power to deal with these uh, with these circumstances and to overcome the fears and the insecurities and and to give us a future and a hope. And uh, and so we we ask that anyone out there that is listening that has not made the decision to invite your son to their life that they would just pray a prayer simply uh, like this: Lord Jesus. Uh, I need you. I am a sinner. I have done many things in my life that are wrong. Without you, I cannot uh, face the future the way that I need to and have the security that I need to have. I'm concerned with my family. I'm concerned with, with what it is that I should be about. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Fill me with your spirit and equip me to deal with the challenges of, uh, of the days ahead. And we pray these uh, things in the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. In so, Jesus' name, amen. Very good. Well, Josh, thank you for the opportunity to come on board and, and talk about what is a, a solemn, uh, somber issue, but yet it is, uh, it's the truth. And it's a uh, truth that we must confront and deal with and face and, and take action on. And so uh, I hope that it will be a blessing to, to your audience. Yeah, I hope the same thing, and uh, again, I can't thank you enough for coming back on. We'll definitely have to 
have you back on in the future. Absolutely. We'll, we'll do some more. And uh, next time I come on, I'm hoping I'll bring this guy that happens to be an expert in, um, uh, in uh, has, has studied Russia for 20, 20 some years. And uh, perhaps we can get him to come on the show and talk more specifically about some of the, uh, the actual military threats and uh, why many of the things I've talked about tonight are, are uh, you know, more than just conjecture. Yeah, absolutely. Keep me posted, and we'll uh, we'll definitely set that up. That'd be great. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. God bless. Yep. God bless you too. All right. That again was S. Douglas Woodward, uh, author of the new book, "Is Russia Destined to Nuke the U.S.?" Examining the mounting near-term threat of nuclear war on our nation. Make sure to check him out and uh, you know pick up his materials. I I have many of his books. And uh, they've never left me disappointed. So, of course, I, I highly suggest Doug's work. Um, if you would like to find more episodes of The Sharpening, you can do so at ministrycom and my YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash Josh Peck Disclosure. Also, if you care to help support Mini Study Ministry, you can uh, do so at ministrycom There's a, a link for donations. Uh, your donations go to the everyday running of Mini Study Ministry, and they help bring you more episodes of The Sharpening, as well as more books and uh, other materials. And as, as I say in every episode, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll say again, please only donate if you feel led. Uh, you can always pray for us, and uh, you know we can always use more prayer. A lot of times that's more effective anyway. Um, we're not 501c3, not that we're against it, we're, we're just not. So your donations aren't uh, tax deductible. And I'm never going to be the kind of person that's going to promise extra blessings from God or a miraculous tenfold return on your money or anything like that. Uh, we're not in the business of making promises for God. But what I can promise is that your help, be it uh, prayer or financial, it's greatly appreciated, uh, keeps us going, and it's the only reason that we're able to continue doing what we do. So all of that being said, we are all out of time. Uh, this has been The Sharpening, and once again, I am your host, Josh Beck. Uh, as always, take care, and God bless. Mm -hmm.